Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I have the pleasure this evening to introduce Banas Farahi. Banas, we're lucky to have her come back um, because she it's, uh, it's the second time you join us here in Yak. Yeah, so it's great to that we have such interesting people join us again. Uh, we're lucky enough to have her come up to the Masters of Advanced Interaction studio to see what the students are working on for tomorrow's midterm, uh, which I think is very really related to the work. She's been a great reference for us. Um, and I'm just going to read a few things here, uh, maybe that she's going to propose in, the, in her talk, but what if our environment could detect our physical movement and emotional states and respond accordingly? The, this presentation, or Banas' presentation, addresses interactive material interfaces that respond to the behavior of the human body and its emotions through the implementation of emerging technologies. Um, Benaz Farahi is a designer and creative technologist based in Los Angeles, working at the intersection of fashion, architecture, and interaction design. Trained as an architect and specializing in 3D printing and physical computing, her ultimate goal is to enhance the relationship between human computing, uh, sorry, human beings and their environment by following morphological and behavioral principles inspired by natural systems. Benaz is a recipient of a number of prestigious awards, including the 2016 World Technology Award, Design Award, and the 2016 Innovation by Design Fast Company Design Award. Her work has been featured in various television channels, including BBC, CNN, and in leading journals and newspapers, such as Wired and The Guardian. She's currently an Annenberg Fellow and is completing her PhD in inter Interdisciplinary Media Arts and Practice at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Benaz to the stage. Thank you, Benaz. One is better. Okay, hi everyone. Um, should be good, huh? Um, it doesn't come closer. Okay, so we just, um, I'll stick with this one. Um, hi everyone, it's an honor to be back here. I really like um, Barcelona and Yak for sure. Um, I mean, being here is just you're having a great food in Barcelona. You, you guys have to appreciate that. I'm sure you do. But also, Yak is always full of energy and atmosphere is always inspirational for me. Uh, so it's great to be back. Um, I work in the intersection of uh, fashion, architecture, and interaction design. In my work, I explore the relationship of human body with interactive technology. Yep. Is it better? In my work, I explore the relationship of human body with interactive technology, ranging from the scale of wearable computings all the way to the world of interactive architecture. Um, and um, in this type of work I explore, I'm going to take you through this journey of how I develop this type of work. But as computing technologies are basically populating our everyday life, I think it's very important to start uh, to think that how these computational devices are embedded in our environments, from the um, architectural spaces that they have sensors, to garments that they have various in sensors that read information from your body, from feet speed to, to Spire, to various devices, it's very important to start to rethink that what does it mean for these computational de devices to, to interface with your body. So in my work, I explore the potential of interactive, soft, shape-changing materials of the environment. So I explore how the shape or the form of the materials can change their shape in response to the users in order to create soft, reconfigurable spaces. In this type of investigation, the main inspiration really comes from the world of nature, not 
both, not just in terms of how things in nature looks like, which is absolutely fascinating, but also um, in terms of their behaviors, in terms of their intelligence in responding to both internal as well as external stimuli. So for me, it's very interesting how we can actually look at the materials as these um, uh, systems that they can be augmented with some sort of intelligence in responding to their environments or to their internal uh, stimuli. In my body of work, I explore the notion of embodied emotional interaction, which is less about what task actually has been done, but more about how we can develop a new empathetic relationship between human and that of built environment. In this type of work, um, uh, the main challenge is really looking at, uh, at least for me, is really looking at two interconnected activities. One, how I develop materials, and then secondly, how I look at um, uh, implementation of robotic technologies into those uh, material substrate. I started this type of journey from um, looking at um, architectural installation scale. Uh, I started playing with some ideas around um, interactive architecture and how we can, for instance, look at um, remote sensing. For instance, we use our hand for various uh, communication purposes. Um, we use our hands for also communicating with our daily devices, such as our phone or our laptop or our iPad. So this time was very interesting that how we can actually look at this sort of natural gestural language of our hand movement as a, as a, as a way for communication with the architectural space. Um, so like dragging or swiping or zooming is part of the natural language that we already use. So how we can use that to actually communicate with, with architectural space. Um, can we just sit down on our couch and change the shape of our environments with our hand movements? But then this project was, for me, was having, I have some issues with it because you had to stand in one place and basically interact with the uh, with architectural space. But we know that architecturally we just move in the space so, so freely in three-dimensional space. So in this project, this um, um, three, uh, robotic uh, ceiling, um, we had a computer vision Kinect motion capture camera that it actually sees her body or sees the movements of the people underneath the ceiling as they occupy the space dynamically and the shape of the environment change uh, accordingly. So basically the number of people underneath the ceiling or the type of activities underneath the ceiling can change the shape of the environments. Really the main concept behind this project, which was sponsored by a steel case company, was um, uh, looking at how we can create a reciprocal relationship between human body and um, built environments as they're shaping one another. These ideas didn't stay just in the world of architecture. Um, of course, for me, it was very interesting soon to realize that these, these sensory technologies, they're already changing or shaping um, who we are. Uh, I was really fascinated by the work of cognitive scientists such as Andy Clark, um, neuroscientists such as Antonio Damasio, but mainly Andy Clark by the notion of cyborg and the fact that we are already cyborg, not because of how many implants or silicon we have underneath our, our, our skin, but because of the uh, relationship that we have with our devices. The cell phone is already part or extension of uh, one's body. So this was very interesting to think about, okay, so we have already these sensors out there that they can change our body. So how we can really think about that extension and how we can uh, um, sort of start to redesigning the human body. We also, um, uh, with Neil Leach, uh, we uh, um, co-edited an issue of architectural design on 3D printed body architecture in which we looked at how um, uh, architecture or architecture discipline has in a way changed um, what it means to be architect. A we, we featured series of um, uh, very exquisite works by, va by various architects um, that they work in not just conventionally accepted world of architecture, but something more. So they, their number of 3D printed uh, items that either designed for human body or in the scale of human body. 
I started working um, with these ideas with the Synapse. Synapse um, is an interactive helmet that responds to your brain activity. So it basically has a sensor, EEG sensor, that it can capture your brain frequency. Those, um, uh, basically, those information from your brain can be sent to a microcontroller, and the microcontroller map the level of attention or your attention level to the motion of the helmet. So as you think more, the helmet opens up, and as you think less, the helmet goes down and creates a cocoon around your head. One of the main um, idea behind this project was um, how we can actually blur where our body finish and where the artificial environment uh, starts. If we can control something with the power of our brain, can we claim that that object is part of our body because we have a direct control over it? used a uh, uh, 3D printing in Pier 9 using multi-material 3D printing that um, changes in hardness and softness, which I will go through uh, the next project in more details. The next project is Caress of the Gaze. Uh, Caress of the Gaze is um, an interactive uh, garment or multi-material shawl or cape that it, it is equipped with a facial tracking camera that it can see uh, where you're looking at and based on where you're looking at it moves and responds accordingly. So for this project, I want to break it down um, so you can see the design process behind this project, which can be break down to three interconnected activities. One, how I generate form. Uh, second, how I made the actuation system, how I made them dynamic. And lastly, what was the interaction between the person who is viewing and the people around. So in terms of the form, um, I started this journey when I was an artist in residence in Pier 9 Autodesk in San Francisco, a maker space that they have a variety of machines and 3D printers. So I started working with Object uh, 500, uh, Connex 500, 100 3D printer, in which you can actually 3D print not only one material, but you can 3D print a variety of different material properties. So I started my journey with studying auxetic structure and how you can develop soft and hard materials and how you can think about material distribution using computational system. So I started looking at how, for instance, you can have a hard member and then you can have soft, soft members as a joints that they connect them to, it, to one another. But soon after I realized that when you print these objects, they, they're very easy to break because the connection between two materials is, is very much exposed to failure. However, things in nature, their, their gradients of material properties going from soft to hard without any sharp uh, um, um, connections. So this was sort of the main inspiration in this type of work, uh, which I started looking at how we can look at both the visuals of what, um, for instance, fish scales look like in nature, but also in terms of the material properties. Um, what I realized, um, uh, I was reading a paper at the time that it was saying that uh, the fish um, the, the, the scales in fish body, basically, it's, it's out of hard material, but um, because they're somehow located in a semi-flexible mm, mesh system underneath, they're able to provide enough flexibility for entire body of the fish to flex and bend in different directions. So I started uh, gathering all these uh, different prototypes by um, seeing how we can distribute materials, how, how we can distribute softness and hardness and transition between materials in order to generate a certain type of dynamic behavior. And um, gathering uh, what kind of form transformation um, 
they can lead to just simply by having uh, force by hand, just uh, studying their behaviors. After months, I had almost a libraries of these uh, small prototypes. Each of them, they were showing different uh, dynamic behaviors. Uh, the final print of the piece took about 50 hours and it consists of 11 different material properties. So where you're seeing the white, um, they're basically hard material and there is a gradual transition to soft material. And that would enable uh, the, the form transformation or flexibility for form transformation. The second section of this type of work was really looking at um, uh, actuation and how I made them dynamic. I, I use a shape memory alloy, which is a type of metal that uh, remember its initial states uh, when you heat it up. Uh, so it's temperature actuated alloy and um, whatever you deform it, the moments you heat it up, it just goes back to its initial form. Also, it's known as muscle wire because of the ability that um, um, very uh, organically, it's like a muscle contracts and then expand, um, which is very, very fascinating, but also frustrating to work with. Um, it's fascinating because um, the metal, basically, the actuation is organic, it's very soft, there is no no noise invo involved. Whereas in conventional systems, such as motors or uh, any mechanical system, you always have jerky movements or noise involved. Um, and then uh, it was frustrating because uh, whoever in this group have worked with it, they know that um, uh, even in engineering, controlling shape memory allo alloy is not really easy because the material can get overheated. Um, I started kind of experimenting with these, um, but also as you can see in this video, um, the heating time and the cooling time, cooling time of uh, shape memory allo alloy is not equal, meaning that the material uh, I use a facial tracking camera that it can see um, age, gender, and also where uh, the onlookers is looking at. Um, so basically, the camera, which is a smaller than three millimeter in lens, it's uh, almost hidden underneath the quills, and it can see uh, the onlooker's gaze. Um, what we did, we mapped uh, the pitch and yaw value, which is a number from the onlooker's uh, gaze, or the vector line from the gaze of the onlookers, to the actuators underneath the, the garment. So as you're looking in certain areas, that special node is going to be actuated. And there is eight of those actuators underneath the, um, the garment. Um, but also, I think uh, the notion of gaze is the interesting one because uh, we already, all of us have to some extent noticed, um, even when we are in, in the crowd that you're, someone is looking at you from the back and all of a sudden you look back and you realize that someone is actually looking at you. So you already have this notion of sensing gaze, although you're not literally aware of it. So for me, it was very interesting to play with this notion in a way that how technology in a literal way can make you to be aware haptically of the gaze of the other people around. But also, of course, this uh, uh, has a lot of cultural, social uh, baggage to this project of uh, male gaze on female body. Uh, I think personally, for me, the work of some conceptual artists, such as Barbara Kruger, uh, Your Gaze Hits the Sides of My Face, is one of the big inspiration. Um, and um, the project's somehow got viral and was kind of out of hand in a way and got millions of views and I think um, for me as a designer what was, was interesting was more conversation around it and I think um, uh, creating uh, this sort of conversation that some of them they were absolutely positive to the point that I was receiving emails that where we can buy this this is really interesting and some people that they were absolutely hating the idea so for me it didn't matter if it was positive or negative to create conversation around something that it was socially and culturally sensitive was very, very interesting. This is the video that we made uh, first.
sort of in terms of the material developments in all the projects that I have shown here, um, there is two type of um, investigations. One was how I designed these objects using uh, the material uh, properties, using very advanced computational system and advanced machines such as Connex 500 to develop materials that they change their properties across the material. And the second is material geometries, which I'm going to take you through this. Uh, so these are some of the examples of various prototypes that I have made uh, through ongoing supports that I had from PR9 um, to really study the form transformation with different oxetic structure, different sort of structures that they are able to show dynamic behavior or form transformation. Um, these are um, uh, using uh, some of them really high level of complexity. Uh, the machine can print up to 16 micron resolution. So it was absolutely fascinating to work with this, mach this, this machine um, uh, in person. But also, um, I think um, one thing was uh, this machine is very expensive. The material was absolutely expensive. So you, a lot of time as designers, you always don't have access to this, this, uh, this equipments. Um, so this was kind of interesting for me to start thinking that how we can use cheap machines or cheap materials, but still generate dynamic behaviors. At the time, I was working with a machine that um, I was using a material that it was absolutely fragile, and with the matter of a small force the material was breaking but then we were interested in the notion of dynamic garments and we wanted to make something that moves and changes its shape soon we realized that if you look at the geometry and how the material can be distributed in terms of the, its geometry, we can actually generate dynamic behavior. So for instance, uh, in this case, we realized that if you have um, a spiral or a, uh, in, the, in the form of a spiral, um, with, the brute, with, the, with the fragile material, is it still you able to have a very resilient, very flexible uh, geometries. That was very interesting finding and it led to sort of uh, experience expansion of visual vocabulary just around this behavior, what we can get from simple spiral coil and how we can sort of exploit different forms uh, using um, these geometries. I collaborated with um, Dutch uh, fashion designer Pauline Van Dongen, and which we explore uh, this potential in the form of a top, and how the form of the top can change dynamically um, in, in the body of the wearer. In this case, we use a shape memory alloy inside the, each spiral coil, and they, they uh, create the dynamic uh, transformation. This was the first time that I used a very fragile material, but I was able to actually generate dynamic behavior. The second example was um, when I was in China, and I was using a system. It was SLA printing. Again, very, very fragile material. Uh, but then how we can look at um, generating a flexible material that it can reflect on human body. I was looking at uh, Langer lines. Langer lines are the lines of the skin tension lines or the minimum tension line of the skin. Uh, most of the time surgeons use these lines for incision because their minimum tension line, they heal best, they don't expand or contract, so therefore they're, they're, they're the best lines for, for incisions. So I use these lines as a way of how we can generate a 3D printed top that reflects on these minimum tension lines. Um, so it, um, the result was body escape. Um, which not only looks at these minimum tension lines, but also it's augmented with the sensor, um, which is a gyroscope, uh, which is located on the shoulder of the wearer. And uh, based on how she moves her body um, and uh, with what speeds she moves her body, the lighting patterns uh, changes. So it's really to, to celebrate human bodily movement or um, the subtle movements of human body and how we can sort of uh, synchronize the movements to, to the lighting pattern. project, I was um, almost ready to explore other mediums uh, than just um, 3D printing. Uh, I was 
at some points I was really frustrated in general with like why we have to just use 3D printing. I wanted to use other mediums. Um, and then it leads to the next project, which is Opal. Um, Opal is an em emotive garment uh, in the shape of a dress that it's equipped with facial tracking camera that it recognizes the emotion of the people around and respond accordingly. So a lot of animals, for instance, um, they have these uh, responses, including mice, cats, and, and dogs. They have these responses that their hair kind of stands up when they get intimidated or when um, they basically uh, get very excited about certain things, they, their, their, their fear um, stands up. So this was really fascinating for me. And I started thinking that how um, a garment can do the same, how our garment can work as an as a almost artificial hair for our body and sort of respond to the most subtle aspects of our environment, which is the emotional inputs from our social context. And um, looking at uh, uh, emotion, uh, we already express our emotional states through our bodily movements or facial expressions or um, different ways that we move in the space. Uh, so we're already doing that. But how a garment as a second skin can basically reflect on, on these uh, ideas uh, as well. Uh, at the time I was really, um, I, I think about a year ago, I started getting really inspired by the work of work in the discipline of emotional computing in general. Emotional computing is a term, or affective computing is a term um, that coined by Rose uh, Picards in MIT Affective Computing Group. Uh, but it has a really long history. In the uh, 60s, um, some anthropolog anthropologists such as uh, Paul Ekman really talked about that emotions are not necessarily socially or culturally um, constructed, but they're universal emotions. So he, for instance, uh, done this research in which uh, he looks at various emotions or facial expressions that people in different nations, they, they all have it in common, such as anger or surprise or happiness uh, or sadness. So I started looking at how the computer vision can allow us to, first of all, detect uh, emotion. Uh, so um, our emotional, uh, our system is able to detect five basic emotions, happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, and neutral. Um, and and, um, but the next challenge was how are we going to map different emotions to different dynamic behaviors or correlation between motion and emotion was something that I'm still interested to explore further. Uh, for instance, these two type of work that came out um, one vehicle um, experiments in synthetic psychology in which um, it's coming completely from the world of psychology, but it was really looking at um, how, for instance, through the design of sensor and motor action, we can develop a certain behavior, such as the behavior of a lover or an explorer. So, for instance, a robot that uh, seeking for the source of light, it gives you the, the um, uh, sort of idea of that this is an explorer. Um, or on the right-hand side, you can see experimental study of uh, apparent behavior in which you assign not only different emotional states to these simple abstract geometries such as triangle and, and circles, but also you give it narratives. So they did these experiments and people started giving all sorts of a story that this is what is happening and what you're seeing here. So what, it, what I'm trying to discuss here is that um, the, the connection between motion and emotion, it's something that we can explore further. Um, I started looking at, uh, in this garment, I started doing some uh some behavior study, like how we can control, the, this is a pneumatic system, how we can control uh, different pneumatic behaviors. So for instance, just inflation, just on and then off, or you, ha you can have different sorts of pulsations, such as heartbeat, or you can have agitated movements uh, that it can show the agitation. Um, so in other words, how we can map this information. I think this is absolutely a new area of research that um, uh, is still ongoing and I am uh, quite fascinated uh, by this. And then, of course, when um, you put these uh, objects that they're moving and they have this soft quality and uh, sort of organic movement to it, um, they also uh, give you certain meanings. So uh, based on the context, you um, understand what does it mean. 
Um, the fabrication of this piece, as I said, I wasn't, I was interested to move away from 3D printing. So I started looking at different ways of looking at digital fabrication. So for instance, um, in this piece, we uh, looked at uh, placing uh, fiber optics in a bath of silicon. Uh, for placing the fiber optics, we laser cut the acrylic sheet uh, with a lot of holes. And this was absolutely labor intensive. It was about 150 hours. I had a group of students who were coming and helping putting all these fibers one by one and then um, this is how really this project's done. In terms of the placements and the heights of the fibers, we were looking at um, data captured from uh, curvature analysis of human body to maximize the effects of uh, uh, the movements. So the areas that they have maximum curvature, um, they um, basically have a longer and denser number of uh, fibers. This is the video that project was um uh, we mapped different emotions to different behaviors. So uh, when someone is angry, so how the shoulders can puff, or if, um, uh, sorry, if surprised, shoulder can puff up, or if it's angry, like the entire body can have like this sort of agitated movement to express that agita agitation or ag aggression in a way. Um, and um, the idea is really to change the social interaction between the person who is veering and the people around. Um, but also recently, um, um, just a few months ago, I got commissioned by Adidas to produce a new work uh, really reflecting on this idea of emotional interaction for showcasing uh, their newest uh, predator shoe. Uh, so these are just few sneak peeks of the projects that I want to share with you. Um, the project haven't came out, but it will come out in the next few weeks. Um, uh, but really I'm kind of reflecting on how the computer vision can help us, not for commercial purposes in terms of what you see in the stores um, or advertisement purposes that it can seize what, what is your gender or where you're looking at and they give you a new advertisement, but really to cre create an engaging experience with the visitors and how we can um, have uh, some sort of um, display that it can understand what emotions you have and based on sort of your emotion or how you're interacting it has this character that the character comes alive with dynamic movements, with color changing. It can transfer so much. And we can create engaging experience that it's beyond just 2D digital interfaces, but really uh, taking architectural or object size installation to, to, a, to, a, to a new, new realm. Um, I think... Um, to sort of wrap up um, uh, this talk, I'm really excited about um, the, the, the the exploration of how materials can um, connect with our emotions or with the emotion of the social um, uh, areas that we are in, social cycles. I think um, the materials is not going to be uh, just a static. They're going to shape changing. They're going to be color changing. And I think this is where we are going. I think in terms of interaction design, this is absolutely going to provide us new um, uh, tool sets uh, to think about design and interaction. Um, so I'm very excited to explore this. Um, thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Bernas, for this extraordinary exhibition of uh, translations of human attributes, emotions into this extraordinary computational design interactions. Now, it's customary after every lecture here at IAC to open up uh, to the audience for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hands. Thank you. This microphone is terrible. Um, I wanted to ask if you have thought at all about how, if, if our clothing is going to make us more open with our emotions, how, how, what, kind of, what kind of conflicts do you see uh, coming up with the relationship between emotional clothing, like extroverted clothing, and our maybe increased tendency to be private with devices like smartphones. You know what I mean? Like nowadays there's a strong tendency in public space to just uh, go into your phone and try not, try to avoid communicating with people and engaging people. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I mean it's completely different because I think there's certain, certain things um, that you want to keep private, but fashion is already expressive. We already wear certain garments to express our personality, to express certain things to, to the peoples around us. We, we manifest uh, what we believe in, in a non-verbal way to the, to the world around us. So if you think about that, and if you think that what kind of information would be interesting, either as to to be used as an expressive tool or as a way that connects you to yourself, I think uh, it can be very interesting. For instance, um, the other thing that I want to argue is that a lot of time, as an observer, you might they might not notice that what it means. If the sleeve of your jacket gets red, um, I might not understand what is exactly that information correlate to. However, as a person that you are wearing that and you know those rules, that for instance, your sleeves showing you that, okay, your heartbeat is going high, you're stressed, maybe you need to calm down. And I think that information, there is no problem with like showing that and people might not necessarily understand what it means. Um, I think the issue of privacy is interesting. Um, however, I don't want to say that it's not there. I think um, uh, the more we living in a world that these devices are going are gonna to be populating our fabric of our life, I think it's important to issue them and to add uh, um, that what, what it means. I think um, uh, with finding the right space in between, we should be able to um, like uh, both to express certain e certain areas that you're interested to express as a, as a tool for communication, and to keep the ones that they're private, perhaps as. Uh, things that you want you don't want to share with the world so i think it's important to address them i don't want to dismiss it but i don't think there is a, such a problem to uh, uh for expressive fashion or or garments to not show those information it's faster like this i guess uh, i'm just curious What's your opinion about uh, which are the values, the new values now that fashion should uh, represent in the future? I mean, uh, for sure you are talking about interaction, and interaction that uh, is connected with our own body, so with our, with our internal feelings as well that we are expressing uh, outside using the, the garment as a medium no? for this communication. But which other values uh, you, you envision in fashion, you know, outside interaction? Wait, wait. So what do you mean by I mean, uh, with values, I, I talk about what else can we do with materials. Uh, our materials can probably, uh, but I'm, if I explain, you probably I give you my own opinion. But uh, you know, so I have my position. We can discuss about it, uh, but. I see potential, a lot of potential into materials uh, and a lot of connections that you can establish through them. So outside interaction, what else do you envision? 
Yeah, I think if I understand your question right, um, yeah, I mean, um, for instance, one thing that I, I, I mean, I think screens and 2D digital in 2D digital interfaces is going to advance more and more. They're going to be embedded everywhere, even maybe in our garments. I don't, I'm not sure, but I am more interested in a sort of. Um, um, paralinguistic sort of communication between materials and people. In other words, what does it mean if something wrinkles versus something just bulge out or something just curl up? Uh, and how we can develop sort of library or taxonomy of different behaviors that they already communicate. Uh, I mean, we already can sort of look at our dogs and understand that, oh, this dog is now excited or it's afraid. And, and I think I'm very interested to develop that language, that how we can develop um, material language or a material dynamic language for communication. Um, so that can be through form transformation or color transformation. And I think um, uh, in both cases, there are more exciting opportunities than just screen-based um, interactions. I hope I answered your question. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to know, to know if you have experiment with natural materials or organic uh, material that like biomaterials. Yeah. <laughs> I I haven't. Um, I think I'm interested. Um, but I haven't personally experienced it. One reason was I was always uh, kind of getting frustrated for escapability, escapability of material because a lot of time biomaterials, they just tear apart and they don't last. And I think it's really exciting future and I would be interested to possibly explore some of it. But uh, so far I haven't because I wanted to reduce things that they're scalable, they're robust, so you can keep it for a few months or a few years, and uh, I, I had that struggle with biomaterial. I encounter your work for the first time and I'm absolutely fascinated. Um, but maybe leading on from this question, and I ask as an anthropologist who's concerned about what MIT says about the five basic emotions, and personally I would argue, and with others, that there is much more diversity. Um, and I was thinking whether these you know, biomaterials would allow a more individual approach or unique approach because we know that the way each human walks the human gait is 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 unique to each individual around the world so i don't know how many billions of of modes of of this most simple way of movement there are and what is your kind of vision towards that manifesting in the materiality of the the garments yeah, I mean, thanks for uh, your question, because I think one thing that if I meant that MIT Affective Computing Group is saying that they believe in universal emotion, I didn't mean that necessarily. I think there is certain uh, group of scientists that they believe that there are certain type of physiological responses in human that they're universal, including certain uh, like five or six basic uh, facial expressions that we have. But of course, this doesn't mean that uh, all our physiological responses are actually universal. And emotion, as you said, it's completely diverse um, from micro expressions to the gait uh, and how we walk, how we um, um, talk, and all of that is basically completely socially, culturally constructed. Um, I think in terms of materials, um, I think I, I, I agree that it would be very interesting to have these diversities. And what does it mean uh, for someone in Asia to have these material interfaces versus someone in the US? So I, I think the 
good thing about these interfaces is that they can be reconfigurable. They can be defined based on rules that you would define for them. So I don't see any problem in um, having this sort of materials that they have to universally address. Even these materials, I mean, what my ultimate goal it would be is that to see these materials to be expanded so much across different nations or across different materials that we, we see them with different colors that reflect on certain cultures. I mean, I, in most of my work, use black and white, but then you think about certain cultures and certain, uh, certain ways that they express themselves as a fashion medium, I think it's really compelling a story. Um, so I don't see any problem in um, reflecting on um, those cultural social aspects of any, any nation. We do have... Um, so um, you worked about... Uh, about um, showing the emotion of people but did you already thought about showing not the people but the environment like a reaction about the environment with you are or i don't know a reaction reaction about the pollution where you are and showing something like environmental data yes yeah, not just about interpreting people but interpreting the world around you, I don't know. Yeah, I think in, in the first two projects, I was a little bit going to architectural space, having computer vision that it can see where you are in the space or um, understand your movements. But I agree with you that I haven't necessarily looked at bigger, like, um, capturing bigger information about the city or pollution or, or air temperature or, or there's tons of other data that we can capture. I think mainly because I was always fascinated by this intimate relationship between human body and then what's, what is surrounded by human body. But um, So it was very intimate, I would say. Um, but uh, it's something that um, I think uh, I would be interested. I mean, certainly, I think I don't believe in Internet of Things. Uh, I mean, it was a big buzzword for some time. I, I don't think uh, I'm interested to go to that route. But certainly some information from the city, from our environments, can also be connected to, alert to our... the person. To the person. Like the government can alert the person. And instead of interpreting, like, the other, I don't know, <laughs> like a... Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think as long as um, your garment doesn't decide for you to, what no, to do, course. to order something else for you, I, I have no problem. But I have absolutely problem with um, giving agency to, um, or AI, um, to completely decide for human. I think it's very important to have the human in the loop and have the human to decide at the end that what is required or what is not. The, the, the garments with sensors or environments with sensors are there to augment our intelligence, not to replace our intelligence. I completely agree. <laughs> and that way we'll conclude today's lecture. Thank you very much once again for an amazing lecture. Thank you guys for your questions. Thank you for your presence. Please feel free to, we have chips and cava and beer actually in the back. So please feel free, have some.